for those who don't know you, would you please introduce yourself and tell us what you do? So my name is Sadie. Sadie Ryan and I am from Scotland and I live in Glasgow so one of the two two biggest cities in Scotland I think it's yes the biggest city in Scotland and I work at the University of Glasgow um, as a lecturer in languages and intercultural studies I just started two weeks ago so it's all quite quite new at the moment but very exciting and I make a podcast called Accentricity which I've been making for a couple of years now and it's all about language and identity sometimes it's about learning different languages and what that has to do with identity um, and a lot of the time it's about accents and identity and just the different ways that we speak and what that has to do with who we are as people i wanted to begin with the section about linguistics because you have made a phd in social linguistics right mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First of all, how do people react when they know about your profession being a linguist? To be more precise, to be a, a social linguist, what are some of the reactions? I think the first reaction a lot of people have, especially if they don't know very much about sociolinguistics specifically, is, oh, so you must speak loads and loads of languages. Um, like, what languages do you speak? Or sometimes I've had people just start speaking to me in German or Russian or something. Mm. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, I don't speak lots of languages at all. Um, I mostly just speak English and a little bit of Polish and a little bit of French and a little bit of Gaelic. But I've just started learning Gaelic, but really mostly just English. So that's often a bit of a surprise to people. But obviously, some linguists do speak loads of languages and I really um, wish I was one of them. I'm quite jealous of that. Um, but my work, linguists tend, depending on what kind of linguistics you do, I think it's fair to say that linguists tend to specialise in one or maybe two languages um, and focus their research on just one or a few couple of languages at a time. Um, I also work on, I study multilingualism a little bit, so I kind of look more broadly about how different languages interact in our lives. Um, but yeah, so generally speaking, so linguistics is the study of language and it's incredibly varied and broad. And if you're to ask what a linguist does day to day, it varies an incredible amount. Yeah. Um, linguistics <laughs> is really, really varied in terms of what we do and what, what our day to day jobs look like. And I must confess, to be honest, because at a certain point, I also thought <laughs> that every linguist is able to speak many, many languages. Mm. I don't know why exactly, but I, I've done some researches and some dictionaries online. Yes. They even write it in the explanation well, sometimes. It's not, that... <laughs> it's not necessarily wrong. There's kind of two meanings of the word linguist. So one definition of linguist is somebody who speaks lots of languages and is interested in languages and mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. specifically learns like so that is one definition yes. of linguist it's just not the one that really applies to me <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> so it's, it's definitely not wrong but i think that is <laughs> so beautiful in general when it comes to languages because there is no white and black it mm. is always more layered right so mm. that makes it really beautiful but also difficult sometimes <laughs> really complicated. I think when I was younger and I, I mean, I didn't know that studying language was a thing that you could do when I was in school. So I knew that you could learn another language. We learned French in school and I knew that there was a subject in school called English where, um, even though we all came to school speaking English pretty much, most people in my class came to school speaking English, even though generally we did we we had a class which was quite often about learning about proper grammar and kind of right yeah. and wrong and then it all got mixed up with kind of spelling and punctuation and then when i went to university i i was actually studying english literature um cuz i really liked reading and writing and i had a compulsory class that went with that called uh, english language and linguistics which i was really not thrilled about i thought i was going to hate it and I thought it was going to be about how to speak English right. And like, I went to a school where a lot of people, we, we were often made to think that we spoke English wrong because we had an <laughs> accent that 
that wasn't you know it's it's like you were talking about in Switzerland and speaking German where you are like we tended to speak in a way that wasn't thought of as the sort of the Queen's English the standardized proper way to speak <laughs> so we were quite often being told that we spoke wrong <laughs> um and I thought that this class was going to be more of that and I was really surprised to learn that one of the first things they taught us is there's no such thing as correct grammar and incorrect grammar there's just different types of grammar even if you're learning a language, you might have a different way of speaking than somebody who's a native speaker. Doesn't mean that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just different. Yeah. And we can actually talk about and study the differences in the way that we speak. So the way that people from certain places speak differently to people from other places, even when it's an English speaking an officially English speaking country, um, and people who are learning English might speak a little bit differently to people who've spoken it all their lives because their other languages are influencing the way that they speak and there is beauty in that variety and it's, it's not right or wrong it's just different and that's kind of that's how I like to think of sociolinguistics so the term sociolinguistics is so socio as in society or sociology and linguistics as in language so it's the way that society and language interact and a lot of that comes down to different groups of people speaking differently so sometimes it's about in what I look at we look at social class quite a lot so the way your sort of class background might have something to do with the way you speak we look at gender quite a lot so gender differences in the way people speak we look at ethnicity different different ethnicities and differences in the way that we speak um and yeah, so it's, it's a really interesting subject to me because I've always been really interested in identity and I've always been really interested in language and it's the way that language and identity and society all interact comes together in sociolinguistics, which is, yeah, that's why I love it. And so does it mean that the fire sparkled kind of at university when you when you took these lessons and then, uh, then you, your passion began. <laughs> You've got such a lovely term of turn of phrase. I love that. The, the fire sparkled. Ab absolutely. Like, yeah, definitely. So I, like I say, I took this class thinking that I was gonna, um, it was gonna be boring <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and that class was what got me interested very mm. much, but I think I was interested beforehand. It's just that. I didn't know it was something you could do for a job. So I think there were kind of, it was already in me. So I, I remember in a way though, I think it's kind of in all of us, like I've never really spoken to anybody about my job or about sociolinguistics who hasn't on some level been interested in that in their own life, because <laughs> it's something we all have a stake in and we all experience yes. one way or another. Um, but we are maybe unaware of that. It's something that that is yeah. in, is subconsciously we mm. we apply it, but uh, we don't know it theoretically, right? Yes, <laughs> yeah. Like we all we talk about it all the time. Like I think outside of people who study it for a living, um, we're always being like, "Oh, you say that word like that. That's funny. I say it like this." And oh, that person's got a funny accent. And you know, so even when I was a little kid, it, we would notice differences in the way that people spoke and be like, oh, that person must be from England because they speak like this. And it was already a big part of my life before I was studying it for a job. And I remember in French class, I remember, so I would have been maybe about 14 or 15 and we were learning French and I just suddenly was like, oh, and so we were, we'd had a textbook, which was about the, a day in the life of these two French kids and I remember like noticing that they seemed to be really fancy French kids like they, they lived in a big fancy house and they were kind of playing playing tennis after school and they just seemed quite fancy to me and I remember saying to my teacher are we learning posh French because <laughs> I was very aware that in English there were kind of posh ways of speaking English and then what to me seemed like normal ways of speaking English. Like, is that the same in French? Like, are we learning posh French? And our teacher was like a little bit sheepish because I think she knew that we wouldn't really 
necessarily all want to be learning posh French. Um, <laughs> but she was like, yes, yeah, so we're kind of, we're learning Parisian French and that's, yeah, we can, kind of, yeah. <laughs> um, so at that point I was like, oh, it's really interesting that like, that is something that happens across languages and yeah. So I was already quite interested in that. Um, and then I found out it was something you could do for a job. It's like, oh, brilliant. This is, this yeah. is great. And um, I remember that in one of your episodes, there was a woman who was considered talking in a posh way. And then I think she got a, a job and the interviewer thought of her that she was very educated or I can't remember exactly how the yeah, details I think, are. I think you're thinking of my friend Jenny, who was one of, yeah, she's brilliant interview. I love, I love speaking to her about this. So yeah, she, um, that was quite an interesting one because I think that a lot of the time in sociolinguistics, the kind of messages we're telling people, we're kind of trying to get to the public are that all ways of speaking are just as good. All accents, dialects and languages are just as good as each other from a linguistic point of view. And it doesn't really make sense to be saying that people need to speak one way and not another yeah. at all times. And we should be appreciating difference. So I think my kind of general way of thinking about language is that people speak differently and that often has something to do with their background, their family, where they come from. So I was quite surprised when I spoke to Jenny and she said, my background doesn't match the way that I sound at all. <laughs> so she's from a much more working class background, but she, and she described herself as sounding mm. relatively posh and she feels like that doesn't match up with her background and people make the wrong assumption yeah, when they yeah. hear her speak. They think <laughs> that she's from a more privileged background than she is. And she really dislikes that. She would rather that people did know who she was from the way that she spoke. So that kind of challenged some of my ideas about how language and identity work a little bit. I think that one of the sort of assumptions I would have made before speaking to Jenny is that we communicate something of our identity when we speak, um, either consciously or subconsciously or a mixture of both. And so I was quite surprised that Jenny was like, no, I would like to communicate more of my identity in the way I speak and I can't. And that was really, really interesting. So it was kind of a bold move to start because that was the very start of the entire podcast. I started it with <laughs> that interview with Jenny, um, which kind of went against everything that was quite surprising and confusing to me. But I think that's one thing that's quite important to me in my podcasting is to lean into the bits that I find confusing <laughs> and kind of almost center those bits because there's the bits that I think are quite interesting and cool. Yeah, it's incredible how people make these assumptions. Mm. Me too, me too. I think everyone mm. makes it up to a certain degree, right? Mm. So in my case, for example, when I am saying one single word in my dialect and other Swiss colleagues, they already know, oh, you come from that district. Mm. Oh, then you must be like that. Oh, uh, and I am already in this box, right? <laughs> it's like a stereotype. What do you think are the stereotypes that people have based on the way you speak? We like a lot of wine, right? <laughs> we <laughs> we yeah. like to drink wine and we like to eat cheese, for example, mm -hmm. melted cheese. And, and of course we like to ski and then. Mm -hmm. And there are many other things, but it's just, it's hilarious because it's not, it's not always true. So, but <laughs> yeah. and some of them are open, right? They, they like me, even though they don't mm. know me and, and others, they, they say, oh no, I, I don't like that accent. Mm. It's yeah. kind of funny and it's only because of the accent. <laughs> mm -hmm. And mm. it's funny the way sometimes the good and the bad gets wrapped up together. So. Um, I get quite a lot of compliments on my accent from people who have a different accent from me. So recently I've like been on the radio a couple of times, like the, the UK radio talking about linguistics and, and accents and dialects. And it's incredible how often when, and, and this would be radio that quite often would be recorded in London. So quite far from where I'm from. 
Um, and it would be, yeah, so it's it quite, quite amazing the number of times I've gone on the radio and the first thing they've said is, oh, you're here to talk to us about accents and you have a lovely accent and kind of <laughs> comment on my accent. And it, it's really, it's really funny and straight because I suppose what's very strange about it to me is that as a linguist, I'm very aware that everybody has an accent, including people who have the most prestigious, mm. um, upper class kind of accents. They, they have accents too. So next time that happens to me, if somebody says, oh, you have a lovely accent and you're talking about accents and you have an accent, <laughs> get that a lot. Next time I'm going to be like, oh yeah, you have a very interesting accent too. And I think they'll, they'll be very surprised when I say that because yeah, there's this funny thing where some people think, oh, I don't have an accent. Or I think this happens a lot when you're learning a language as well, where people talk about, um, oh, you're, you speak English with an accent, but like yeah. everybody speaks English with an accent. Like I'm a native speaker. I speak English with an accent. The queen speaks English with an accent. <laughs> um, David Attenborough, you know, people, people who are on the BBC, these people all speak English with an accent. Um, and that's quite important to remember. I think it's just, we have different accents. Absolutely. But sometimes it's a little bit sad because it seems to me that a lot of language learners are trying to, to get rid of mm. their accent. Right. But I think the goal should be to be more understandable to others. Mm. And as mm. long as the communication works, it's no problem. Right. So. Mm. I think that there is this notion in mind that can maybe hinder you to, to get further, or maybe it has an, a psychological effect on you. So for example, in my case, oftentimes I get stuck because I get nervous. I began to stammer or stutter, but mm. oftentimes it's just because I am too nervous, right? That, yeah, it's, it's like, yeah. I am, I am, um, hindering myself. <laughs> my thoughts. I think it's a, it's a really important lesson as well for people who, well, I suppose, yeah, if people who are learning languages and people who aren't, but anybody who interacts with somebody who is learning their language when they're a native speaker, right? So as a native speaker of English, I speak to quite a lot of people every day who have learned English. I suppose you would be speaking to people sometimes who are learning German, maybe a different type of German from yours. And I think that there's so much focus a lot of the time on the language learner trying to, you know, speak without an accent or make themselves understood. And I, I wish there was more focus on listening and how yeah. to listen properly. So for me, when I'm speaking to people who are learning English, I think it's quite important for me to try to understand <laughs> and to listen properly. Um, and I think this is maybe particularly a bit of a problem with English speakers where we sometimes are like, I don't know, not everybody, but sometimes people can be impatient or can be like, oh, you know, people should speak more clearly when they're, <laughs> when they're speaking English as a foreign or second language. But, um, yeah, actually we should, we should listen better and, and listening is a skill, like speaking and making yourself understood is a skill, but listening and trying to understand people is a really important skill too. Absolutely. Um, which we should be taught in school, really. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Us. I agree. And mm. maybe a, a nice fact in my case, I started out with my podcast speaking in English, right? So mm. for me, it was easier to start a podcast in a foreign language than in my own language oh, interesting. because I. <laughs> I was ashamed, right, to speak in standard German. It's that identity thing as well, isn't it? Because, I mean, would you, would you sort of feel like you had the option of completely changing the way you spoke or would it feel really strange to you? I mean, it would feel strange to me if I really wanted, I could work on that, but I just. I think it's okay to not want to as well, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe I should give it a try and, and just see what happens. M maybe people like it to hear a voice, which usually you never do. You never do. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of interesting stuff happening with language in Scotland at the moment, or I mean, has been happening for a long time, but like one of the things is, um, with Scots. So, so when I, I wouldn't 
I wouldn't really count myself as a Scots speaker most of the time, although I kind of have bits and pieces of it. But there's quite a lot of people in Scotland who would speak in a way that, like, sounds very, very different from standard English. And when I was growing up, I just thought of that as being, like, just having a strong Scottish accent or, you know, using lots of Scottish words or using some Scottish grammar. Um, but even at that time and more so now, there's a lot of people who were saying, no, Scots is a separate language from English and now it officially is. So it's been officially recognized, yeah. um, under the European charter of minority languages as being a language separate from English. But then it's quite complicated because I think a, a lot of people in Scotland haven't taken, like, don't know that or don't, um, don't think of it as being a separate language. And there's, there's been like a lot of really exciting work recently, like language revitalization and, and work to kind of have Scots in schools as a subject in its own right, and to kind of mm. appreciate and support Scots language, um, poetry and Scots language podcasts. So there's actually quite a few Scots language podcasts now, and it's all, it's all really exciting, but like also really, really strange to somebody. So there's, there's like, so now there's, okay, I get, again, it's something I've come across recently. I think it's been around for a while, but there's more and more classes mm -hmm. where you can go and learn Scots. And sometimes that would be people who've moved to Scotland and they're learning English. And then they're also going to classes to learn Scots. And sometimes it would be for people like me. So I could sign up for a class to go and learn Scots, even though I kind of already <laughs> like i definitely understand it and i kind of already speak some of it but kind of not but it's that this really strange thing of in terms of identity it feels it would feel really strange i don't know it's it's complicated it's something i've not got my head around yet um but it's that really interesting thing of when you've got a way of speaking that's particularly <laughs> so the idea for me of somebody who is from a different country, like somebody from England or Germany or Spain learning Scots and then speaking Scots to me is really strange because to me, it's so attached to Scottish people. Yeah, yeah, I see. And I'm not saying it should be at all. In fact, it probably yeah. shouldn't be, but I find it really hard to kind of break that connection and say, well, it's a, like, I've learned French, I've learned some Polish. So like, why, why not? Like, why could somebody not learn? Scots in the same way that I can learn <laughs> French. Obviously they can, but it feels strange. So I think sometimes, sometimes logic doesn't really work so well with language or you have to kind of challenge yourself and push yourself to take on new layers of logic, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I find it really interesting talking to people who are not from Scotland about this though, because, um, I think it's something that these kind of feelings a lot of Scottish people would share, but then when you try and explain it, it's hard to explain why. <laughs> yeah, I see. Well, I would love to see more courses and the like in mm. Scottish English. It's mm. coming out right now, if I am uh, understanding you correctly. Yeah, I suspect you'll probably, if things keep going the way they're going, you'll probably see more of it in yeah. the coming years or decades, because that's the direction things are going in. So I wonder if the feeling might be, that was why I was thinking of it. I wonder if the feeling might be slightly similar to with Swiss German, where if I was to go to classes and learn Swiss German and then speak it to you, would you find that quite weird? <laughs> Maybe. Could well, you be like, you're not from. I mean, it's more complicated because if you say Swiss dialect, which one? Mm. Because. Oh, right. Got you. Yeah. Scots is the same, actually. Scots is the same, like there's different regional yeah. varieties. And because, yeah. for example, other Swiss German people, sometimes they don't understand me, even mm -hmm. though we both mm -hmm. speak in Swiss German, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. So my dialect has unique words, for example, and other pronunciation and other grammatical structure. So yeah, mm -hmm. the, the first thing would be, which course would you take? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, Scots is the same. So you'd have the same, you, you do have the same issues with Scots. So, um, the classes that I know about that I'm thinking of are particularly in Doric, which is the type of Scots spoken in the Northeast, but 
somebody from there might not always understand somebody speaking Glaswegian Scots. And then Shetlandic Scots is really different. So there's Shetland and Orkney are the islands up to the north of Scotland or off way off the north coast. And there's completely different varieties there. So yeah, so there, there are mm -hmm. the same issues. So that makes it even more interesting and complicated. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and by the way, if the listeners are interested, all of these dialects you can uh, hear in, mm. in uh, your podcast, right? Mm. And if anybody's interested in really, if anybody really wants to hear what does somebody sound like in, if they're speaking Scot, like what does Scot sound like in all the different parts of Scotland, there's a really good resource online called the Scot Syntax Atlas. So syntax is in sentence structure, but actually they've got samples of people speaking so you can hear the accent and the words as well. Um, and they have a big map of Scotland and you can click on uh, just different areas of Scotland and you'll hear what the different types of Scots sound like. And that's a really good resource for learning more about Scots if people are interested. Great. I will put it on the show notes as well. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Mm. What fascinates you the most about languages or uh, let's put it mm. another way. What is the best thing that you've learned about language? Actually, this comes from our bonus episode of Sadie's podcast. This is the episode called the best thing I've learned about language yeah. in which Sadie interviews her students and everyone is, uh, yeah, talking about something that they have learned, I guess, during the year. And it's very I interesting. Some really good one. I think the best things I've learned about language, it's difficult for me to be really specific, but I think it's been incredible to learn. The best things I learned about language are that every way of speaking is equal until we start to get involved with the different power dynamics and the politics of language. The idea that what we say about the way people speak is political, if that makes sense. And when politics gets involved, because like I say, when I was younger, I did just think that there were ways of speaking that were better and easier to understand. Mm. So that kind of Queen's English, BBC English, standardizing. We don't really have a name, like a, a good single name for it, even as linguists, but that sort of really prestigious, um, upper class en English. I just always thought that that was the best one growing up and it was the easiest to understand and maybe the most pleasant sounding and the most proper and the most correct. And it was mind blowing to me to find that that's not true at all. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and, and, and I keep talking about English cause that's what I know, but obviously this applies in lots of other languages as well, where you have like a version of that language that's thought of as the best. Yeah. And it's, I think what blew my mind was when I realized that that is just the type of the, the variety that's spoken by the most powerful people. Um, and it's usually the type of language that we associate with rich, white, upper class, native speakers. It's definitely, definitely never the way that people, that, that migrants or language learners mm -hmm. speak. Um, and that that's a political thing. I think that's the most, the coolest and most interesting thing I've learned about language. Yeah, because I think that up to a certain degree, the medias or the politics, they can decide, or, mm. or maybe it's society who decides, but mm. for example, if my dialect is never broadcasted in television, then people, they, they are not used to my accent yeah. and they, they won't understand me. But mm. if all of a sudden television is showing my dialect every day, then people will get used to it, right? They, mm -hmm. they will be familiar with it. It's a better way mm. to say it, but maybe. And I mm. think it's, it, it was the same in, in Scotland. I think, mm. as I remember also from one of your episodes. Since childhood too, sometimes we've been made ashamed of some of our Scots voices, uh, particularly in, in television broadcasting. Um, when I was wee, I remember hearing a Scots voice speaking on the telly and asked my mum what was wrong with this person's voice, because I'd never heard a Scottish person speaking on television. The, the woman also told that she remembers that back in the day when she watched something 
with a Scots accent, all of a sudden she thought, yeah, what is that? Uh, mm. Because it was the very first time in which she, she was able to watch something in, in that particular accent. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And then it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where it becomes this circle where you don't hear it. So then you, you're not exposed to it enough. Yeah. So then you don't understand it. So then you think, well, it's just difficult to understand. Um, and actually, if we were exposed to more variety in the language that we hear, we wouldn't find it so difficult to understand. <laughs> um, and I think that's really important. And I think the other thing that I've learned that I think is really important is that we can challenge and undermine that. And by exposing people to more variety and by questioning people's assumptions about which types of language are good and which are bad. And by talking to people, I think it's probably especially important to get conversations going amongst people who speak types of like English or any other language, which are marginalized and stigmatized. But if we are able to get conversations going about the fact that, that, that those aren't bad ways of speaking, <laughs> um, those are really important ways to challenge that. And I think it can be challenged and. Yeah, that's my other favorite thing that I've learned okay. about language, I think. Cool. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask you about a typical day as a linguist, but as you told us before, it's, <laughs> it's difficult. There, there is no typical day. So, but maybe you could tell us more about your research that you did mm. back in 2014. What yeah. was that all about? Oh man, yeah. So my PhD research, I did it. So I, f I finished and handed in in 2018. I started doing my field work in 2014 and I did research in a high school in the East End of Glasgow, where there were quite a lot of kids who'd moved from Poland. And I looked at what the experiences of those kids were like, and then how that related to or fed into their linguistic development. So one of the big questions was, so Glasgow, for people who don't know, has quite a specific, well, we've been talking about Scots, so Glaswegian Scots. So there's kind of within Glasgow, you'll hear people speaking something that's more like standardized English with a Scottish accent, and you'll hear people speaking, um, something that's a bit different. So Glaswegian Scots officially recognized now as a separate language from English. So if you're moving to a high school in the East end of Glasgow, which is one of the areas where you'll hear more Glaswegian Scots, you're being exposed to lots of different languages because there's people from all over move, well here, I'm, I'm, I'm in the East end of Glasgow now. So this, this area that I'm in, there's people from all over the world move here, but you'll also hear kind of more what we'd call Scottish standard English and more Glaswegian Scots. And then the question is, is that. Is that something that's complicated or confusing for new arrivals? Um, and then what happens when people have been here a while, um, especially teenagers and younger people, they begin to start to, a lot of the time, they begin to start to sound like native speakers, but which native speakers do they sound like? Do they sound more like people speaking <laughs> Scottish standard English? Do they sound more Glaswegian? And one of the big questions I wanted to look at was do people who feel more Glaswegian, end up sounding more Glaswegian, and what does it have to do with identity? And then that opens up a whole fascinating can of worms about what it means to feel Glaswegian. <laughs> um, and so during that time, a day in the life of me as a linguist was not what anyone would imagine really. So I was running an after school club and doing my research there. So I ran this after school club and I gave the kids microphones. Um, we sort of pinned these little microphones on their tops, um, while they were at that. So I was recording them speaking for my research, but I was also chatting to them and doing interviews. And then I was also drawing with them, painting with them. Uh, we did dance workshops. We did, <laughs> um, samba drumming. We did songwriting. Um, so there's really kind of varied and really fun period of field work. And that was, it, you know, it was fun. It, it, it was good because it was fun for the participants and it was fun for me, but it also had a theoretical academic basis because it helped me to spend time with them in a 
natural feeling scenario. So it wasn't just me showing up as a researcher and being like, hello, sit down. I've got a questionnaire for you to fill in. It was us spending, and we did it over a long period of time where we'd spend time together regularly. We got to know each other. They were able to relax around me a little bit. I was able to relax around them. And that helped me to understand their lives and experiences, I think, a lot better than if I'd just been showing up and doing a kind of formal interview. Sure, yeah. Um, So I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've, in case people haven't heard, so the term that we used to describe that would be ethnography. And it just means, um, oh, I don't know if I can give a proper definition of what ethnography means, but in my, because it means lots of different things to different people. But in my context, it meant spending an extended period of time um, in a community that wasn't my own. Although it can be in your own community as well. Yeah, it's a complicated word. But um, it's it meant spending an extended period of time there and just normalizing my presence and observing and sort of. It was great fun. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That really sounds like great fun. Yes. I imagine that linguistics, if you read a book in linguistics, I imagine this could be very hard to understand. It's just an assumption of mine, right? I, you're I not guess... wrong. Depends on the book, but you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I guess that you managed to put these difficult notions from a linguistic point into a podcast so that the layman understands Mm. complicated stuff. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I mentioned earlier that I think that language is something that everybody's interested in and everybody has a stake in. And I think for that reason, it's really important for us as linguists to open things up as much as possible and invite people in who, who aren't professional linguists themselves. So. Um, I'm not the only one who thinks this, there's, there's a lot of really good linguistics podcasts and good people who are really good at communicating linguistic research. Could you recommend some of them? Oh yeah, for sure. So, um, oh, now I'm really nervous about accidentally leaving people out. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but the first ones that spring to mind. So the podcast Lingthusiasm is really good. Again, just communicating linguistics research through a really great podcast. Um, the vocal fries is really good. Um, I have been really enjoying podcasts called on Claire, which is about forensic linguistics specifically. So if anyone is interested in true crime, I know a lot of people love true crime podcasts. This is kind of true crime and linguistics mixed together. Cool. <laughs> um, it's really, it's really, really good. And it's just very well explained. Um, and the person who makes that is called Claire Hardacre. She also has a really fantastic Twitter profile where she explains a lot of stuff that's going on in linguistics really, really well. Um, my former colleague, Rob, I've just stopped working with him in my old job, although we're still doing some work together. His name's Rob Drummond and he has a really great Twitter profile explaining linguistic stuff and also runs a project called Accentism, the Accentism Project where people can share their experiences of linguistic inequality and accentism and, and wait, times that they've been made to feel that the way they speak is, is lesser, or sometimes times that they've experienced positive linguistic discrimination as well. Um, so that's really good. Oh God, though, there's so many, (laughs) (laughs) um, I feel like I don't, so there's a few really good Twitter lists and things as well. I'm pretty sure there's a web page which lists a lot of the good sources for kind of public linguistics. So I can try and find that for you if you like, because that might be quite useful. Okay, great. Yeah. So then that saves me given an exhaustive list. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you explained to us before some sort of field work, right? With this mm-hmm. community. Another way would be, for example, I am reading a book, which is called don't sleep. There are snakes. Mm. It's by Daniel Everett, a linguist and who was for decades living with Piraha, (laughs) Piraha. Oh yeah. 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 And it sounded so fantastic and adventurous to me. He goes there and, and has zero knowledge about the language 
And his mission is kind of to, to pick up their language and write it down. So this was back in 1980, I think, when it mm -hmm. started. This sort of field work, does it exist still? Mm -hmm. Does it still exist? Yeah, absolutely. So it's like, this is going back to what I was saying about linguistics being so incredibly varied. Um, and there's so many different branches. So this is the branch of linguistics that I think often would be referred to as like language documentation, which often it's about, um, so a lot of the world's languages are really, really endangered. Languages are, are just disappearing all the time. Um, and a lot of this is to do with the fact that we have so much pressure to all speak the dominant languages of the place that we live in and the languages that are kind of officially recognized as these are the languages that are going to get you far, you know, uh, English being a big one of them. <laughs> so that's really posing a big threat to lots of different languages. My boyfriend, John, um, pointing there cause he's there in the other room. He speaks Scottish Gaelic, which is a language, which is really seriously endangered, yeah. but there are other languages much more endangered, which are being kind of stumped out by. English and Spanish and other big global languages. We have also a language in Switzerland that mm. is endangered. It is mm. called Rito Romanic, Romance. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's spoken by about 40,000 people, I think. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, there's kind of a big threat to this. So there's a whole field of research, which is about, um, supporting the speakers of these languages as much as possible. And then also documenting these languages, learning about them, communicating about them. Sometimes people who do this work will do things like helping and supporting speak to these languages to, um, make materials for schools so that kids can learn more about these languages who might not otherwise. So we, we have people talk about language revitalization and then also language documentation, which is kind of learning and, um, learning about and documenting the structures of languages like this. Um, so it's actually an area I know much less about, but I believe the podcast field notes is a really good example. If people are interested in learning more about this, it, the, the episodes I've listened to have been about language documentation. It might branch into other subjects as well, yeah. but it definitely has a lot of good interviews with people about exactly the kind of research you're talking about. Um, and also they kind of dig into a lot of the kind of tricky things in this field <laughs> a lot of the time and the ethics of it and stuff. So yeah, field notes. Thank you very much. And would you like to do something like that to, to go abroad and to be with another community and living with them? Interesting question. I mean, I guess I sort of did in my PhD research. It was just that it was a community very, very close to where I live, <laughs> but, um, a lot of the same principles would apply. I suppose I was going and learning about the lives of teenagers and not being a teenager myself. So I could have gone further, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, I kind of had, did have that experience of getting to know a community slightly different from my own and kind of live within that. Yeah. I don't know if I would or not. I think it's tricky. I think it's really tricky work to do in a way that isn't like really tricky work to do in a way that isn't just kind of like a person showing up from a university with all their <laughs> like fancy equipment. And I suppose it's difficult to do in a way that is respectful and equitable. And a lot of people do definitely manage a lot of people do really excellent work in that area. I think I would find it quite hard. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It just also must be, I mean. You know yourself how difficult learning a language is as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the idea of going to a place where nobody speaks the same language as me and I don't speak the language at all and just learning that language. And you don't have any resources maybe to. Yeah. To I don't really, I don't really know. I'm not, yeah. I've not thought about it that much before, to be honest, but I really don't know how people <laughs> say that. Um, I feel like my job's a lot easier. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> mm. So your podcast Accentricity is, uh, about identity and the mm. tagline is every voice is valid. Mm. What do you mean exactly by every voice is valid? But you mentioned it before. 
Yeah. But maybe you can sum it up again. Yeah, I think just what we were talking about earlier there, that, that there's no way of speaking that's better than any other. Um, and I think I wanted that to be really central to, to the podcast, the idea that every language, every dialect, every accent is just as important and just as valid. And we should be listening to what people say, not how they say it. And what does identity mean to you? At this point, I wanted to mention an episode in which you told us about remembering something about your past in which you draw yourself. Yeah. And there were many colors. Do you remember it? Yeah, yeah. So I grew up in Scotland, very much being Scottish, but my mum is, well, my mum was also born in Scotland, but had always felt very Polish and her, she was raised speaking Polish before she spoke English. Um, and her dad was Polish and her granny who helped raise her as well was Polish. So I was raised with like a feeling of not being completely Scottish. My dad as well was Irish English. Oh, that he never would have said he was English. He was, he was Irish, but he grew up in England. Um, so then I had this feeling of having different parts to my identity, um, with these different parts of my heritage. So yeah, I remember being like seven and drawing a self portrait and then being like, okay, so I'm coloring in like my head and my hands are yellow and that means Scottish and my legs are green and that means Irish. And then my torso is, um, purple and my arms are purple and that means Polish. And that felt like something I was trying to figure something out. It's was something very complicated, but I was trying to kind of work it out with, with color coding. And I didn't know actually at the time that this is something that, um, linguists often do when they're asking people about their linguistic identities is they'll get them to draw their body and then write um, <laughs> their different languages within their body. Um, but it was just something that I. Yeah, just did as a kid, as a way of figuring it out myself. Yeah, but um, in your case, it was really special because you didn't speak those languages, right? Yeah. right? That, yeah. that was very special. Not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had this, I was very much raised on thinking that I was Polish, thinking that I was Irish, but I didn't have any linguistic connection to those places apart from through my parents. And not at all really to Ireland because my dad very much felt himself to be Irish. And that was his identity, but he didn't have an Irish accent or speak Irish. Um, and my mum's Polish was very important to me, but I didn't, I didn't learn it growing up. So there was always a little bit of a disconnect between having this feeling of being quite Polish, but not being able to speak Polish at all. Yeah. And there is an episode with your mother actually, in which you tell her story about her identity. At a certain point, you ask her if she was proud of you when you were uh, learning Polish, right? <laughs> and then she didn't want to answer directly. <laughs> you could hear it <laughs> yes. very well. It's really funny because my mum, it's important for me to note, my mum is incredibly uh, supportive and lovely and is always telling me she's proud of me. So it was almost quite a surprise when I was like, so yeah, I learned, I learned Polish to try and so basically I learned Polish when I was doing my PhD research, I was working with Polish kids and I was like, I should learn some Polish. But then it also had this uh, other dimension where I was like, oh, I can learn some Polish to make my mum proud. Um, and it was really quite bizarre when I asked my mum, like, were you proud of me for, for learning Polish? And she was like, I don't know, you sounded kind of weird. And this is some, I don't think this is unusual. To, I don't think this is particular to my mum. I've spoken to quite a few people who have a parent who speaks another language and then feels strange when they don't speak it the same way or when they speak it with a different accent. I think it must just be a really, and I can imagine this as well. So say that I moved to Switzerland and I had kids in Switzerland. And then they spoke English with a Swiss accent. Mm -hmm. I would find that really weird because I'd be like, do you not have a Scottish accent? <laughs> I'm yeah. Scottish. How can you not be Scottish? You're my child. Mm -hmm. So I do get that from my mum. She hears me speaking this kind of beginner learner Polish <laughs> and she's like, but you're Polish. Why can you not speak Polish naturally? <laughs> um, so yeah, I had quite a nice time talking to my mum about it, but she just kept that. 
she just kept laughing and being like, oh yeah, no, I mean, it, your Polish is very good, but in this way that doesn't sound like she thinks it's very good at all. <laughs> now, are you still learning Polish? Uh, not at the moment, so I should really go back to it, but I basically finished my PhD and I finished the course and had learned a little bit and was like, oh, that'll do for now. And I think to some extent, this isn't my mum's fault, but I think to some extent her reaction might have put me off a little bit when I was like, am I ever going to be able to speak Polish in a way that sounds normal to my mum? <laughs> um, so I haven't been learning it recently. I've actually been learning a bit of Gaelic most recently because as I say, my boyfriend speaks it and, um, I feel like that's a really good opportunity. Like him, he speaks Gaelic a lot. So his family all speak it to each other. His, a lot of his friends speak it to each other. I think that's a really good potential learning opportunity for me where I've got the opportunity to be around Gaelic quite a lot. So I feel like I might as well take that at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay. And being a linguist, do you think that it is easier for a linguist to pick up an accent or to learn a language or is no. this, or is this again, <laughs> just an assumption? <laughs> not for me, not for me. I don't know. I kind of might have thought that becoming a linguist would make it easier, but mm, I don't think it has. I think, um, maybe for some people and especially people who do the kind of linguistics where you are kind of studying, like I don't do as much work on the kind of structure of languages. So I don't know if that is maybe it as well. Um, the one place where it has been quite useful is I've learned about phonetics and learning the like phonetic symbols and things that has been quite useful. And when I was learning Polish, that was really, really useful for things like I kind of had an understanding of like, if I knew the sort of technical phonetic symbols or names for certain sounds that we don't have in English, I was able to understand where in my mouth that was produced. So that was quite useful. But, um, no, I, I don't know if I'm unusual or not being a linguist who is really not great at learning languages. <laughs> <laughs> um, but for me, I don't think being a linguist has really, has really helped me learn other languages. Maybe it should have, but, um. Yeah, that's something, I mean, also I'm quite early on in my career as a linguist. So, um, you know, I've been, so my very first linguistic research really was 2014, like you say, yeah, which I is see. a wee while ago, but I think that maybe learning languages is like a step that I need to take next. Maybe <laughs> I just haven't taken that step yet and learned more about other languages. So the Accentricity podcast comes with two series. Mm. No, two seasons, I mean, comes with two seasons so Oh yeah, far. I don't know which it is. I think Americans often say season and UK people often say series, isn't it? I don't know. Okay. And also bonus episodes. So maybe yeah. could you short explain the, the main thing about the first season and, and what it is all about the second season? What are the differences? Yeah. So I guess the first one was more me just dipping my toe into explaining just some stuff that I've been coming across in my linguistic research. Um, the second one, second series season was a little bit different because I wanted to do something that was more, not just me, more kind of working collaboratively with people. So it's, I've called the whole series, the moving project, and it's specifically about language and migration, which is something I'm really interested in, but I decided to kind of bring in the stories of different people who've experienced migration. And it was something I did during the COVID-19 lockdown as like a nice community project. I was kind of stuck in my house and I wanted to have a chance to speak to people. Um, so we ran me and John, actually my, my boyfriend, we ran this online podcasting course. He makes podcasts as well. So he, he does know about these things too. And we ran this online podcasting course open to people from anywhere in the world who had experienced migration in any form. And obviously migration can be lots of different things. It can be temporary. It can be permanent. It can be across the world. It can be within the same country. It can be as a child. It can be as an adult. So it, we wanted to get like a real range of different migration experiences. And with each person, we kind of did a little bit of an exchange where we taught them about podcasting 
in exchange for them teaching us about what it feels to to move from one place to another. Um, so each episode is a different person's story and um, talking about their experiences of language, migration and identity. Um, and yeah, one of those stories is my mum's. <laughs> so my mum took part in the course and uh, that was how I got to ask her about it kind of became both of our story about our family's experience of migration and Polish. And yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. And I can assure you, dear listeners, that it is really worthwhile to, to oh, listen thanks. to the podcast and even binge listen to the podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so your podcast even got awarded. Could you tell us yeah. more about it? We got so... We first of all got nominated for a British Podcast Awards. That was really exciting. It was quite just a short list of six and the others were all these amazing podcasts. I was really, really proud to be kind of on that short list. And then we got a prize. So we won the Independent Media Award from a group called Steady. Yeah, so that was, that was really exciting. There were three podcasts that got selected for that and we kind of got profiled and got some prize money and some training and mentorship over the course of a year. So that was really, really exciting. How did you feel about it winning this award? Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, it was a big surprise. I was quite, quite shocked because <laughs> it was just, you know, the, I, I really love the podcast and I'm really proud of it, but it is something that I've just done as a hobby myself in my spare time. So I wasn't kind of expecting it to be, to get prizes. Um, but it was really exciting that it did. And then it also has helped the fact that that prize came with kind of training and mentorship has really helped the podcast grow. Um, so that's been really exciting as well. And what will the next series be about? Oh yeah. Good question. So, uh, it's not been made yet. Um, but I would really like to, so we're actually still making a few more episodes of the moving project. So that's what we're doing just now. So we're going to have a few more of these stories about migration and identity coming out over the next wee while. Um, but after that, I would really like to make a podcast, which is kind of a deep dive into language in Scotland. So like we were talking about earlier, the kind of like improving my understanding of what's happening with Scots, um, thinking a bit about Scottish Gaelic and my minority languages generally, but specifically in Scotland. And then also thinking about the languages that people have brought to Scotland as migrants. And also I'd quite like to do a video episode about, um, British sign language in Scotland. So basically thinking about linguistic diversity in Scotland and multilingualism in Scotland across all those different areas. That's what I'd like to do. Okay, um, yeah. but obviously it's a big, that that's a big undertaking. <laughs> so, um, there's a lot to dive into there, but yeah, I would like to look at Scotland as a multilingual place and how the different languages of Scotland interact with each other. Sounds promising. Yeah. I will definitely mm -hmm. listen to it. <laughs> oh, thank you. So Sadie, thank you so much. And maybe can you tell us where we can find you or um, yeah, your podcast so, and your website? Yeah, so, so the website for the podcast is www.accentricity-podcast.com. And as far as I know, the podcast is on all the podcast streaming apps, but if anyone finds that it's not on a particular, not in a particular place where they get their podcasts, I would love them to let me know. That'd be really useful. Um, and we're on Twitter at Accentricity Pod and Instagram and Facebook. Just search for Accentricity Podcast. And, um, I can be contacted through all of those if people, yeah, want to ask questions or point <laughs> me in any direction. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sadie. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, would you like to, did you mention doing a bit about favorite expressions? Yes, that would yeah. be lovely. Well, yeah. So my favorite expression. Um, I mean, I've got loads, but I was thinking about this beforehand and there's a Polish expression that I really like, which is, I've heard it being used in English a bit more recently. Um, so it's, it, oh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I'm probably not, but, um, nie mois, nie mój cerk, nie moje małpi, and it means not my circus, not my monkey. Um, and it kind of means something along the lines of. 
if there is a big fuss, a big mm -hmm. mess, lots of chaos going on, but it's nothing to do with you. You it's, want to distance yourself from it. It's not it. your problem. <laughs> not my problem. Not my problem. Not my circus. Not my monkey. So in Polish, it's not my circus, not my monkey. And then when I've heard it in English, people usually say not my circus, not my monkeys. So plural. Um, cool. But I, I quite like that, especially because I think there's often a lot of focus of the influence that English has on other languages and less so the influence of other languages coming into English. And I imagine the fact I've heard this expression a lot in English recently is to do with um, people from Poland moving to the UK mm, quite a okay, lot. Okay, yeah. And kind that of that beautiful. being passed over. <laughs> yeah. I love So I that. wanted to share it because of that reason. I quite, I quite like it. That and I think so it's just cool. a great expression as well, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> it's very useful. I use it all the time. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sadie. Thank you so much. It was really cool to listen to you and really interesting. Linguistics oh. is, is really fantastic. <laughs> I know. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely chatting.